All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is Wednesday, the 15th day of June, in the year of our Lord, 2022. Well, <clears throat> do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the purpose of thinking biblically. Let God's Word transform your thinking. Think according to God's thoughts. His statements. I was going to say opinions, but the word opinion and God really is not quite proper. Now, it's not a personal opinion of God. It's truth. God cannot be, his, his word cannot be called opinion. No. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, the issue of Christians and not being conformed to the world, that also means not being conformed to popular Christianity, the world's Christianity, or the Christian world. Yeah, uh, we always seem to want to go with others to be... There's a comfort in... in uh, uh, following others and being acknowledged by others and... How much of the uh, transgender and the uh, bisexuality and all that stuff that's so popular among the universities, among the students apparently, is actually the result of peer pressure and the desire to be accepted? I guess I was always a nonconformist um, growing up. I, I tended to, when I was like in junior high school and late elementary school and, and after that of course the the Beatles had come in sometime before that and long hair rebellion rock and roll it's is about rebellion rock and roll artists have said that it's sex drugs and what was the other one rebellion <laughs> and it's what it is it's uh it was uh, a rebellion against the the society and the long hair uh, was rebellion against societal norms, uh, and that that doesn't that didn't begin in the late in the fifties and the sixties either. I mean, you go back to the nineteen twenties and the flappers and the speakeasies and all kinds of things. It's just nothing new. Uh, Germany in pre World War II Germany, uh, the Weimar Republic. Which was an awful lot like you know, we a uh, corrupt democracy. Uh, they had the 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 Wonderlust uh, youth movement, and pornography and cocaine in abundance, and you know, Berlin was the uh, uh, what would be the equivalent today? It was the center of culture and debauchery and decadence, <laughs> all rolled into one. The exaltation of man and the autonomy of man. I suppose rebellion is that, or can be that. Sometimes rebellion is good. If you're rebelling against ungodly things, that's a good thing. If you're rebelling in the direction of God, rebelling against a corrupt society, corrupt world, but rebelling in a righteous way, as in your obedience to God, is rebellion against the world. Okay, so here, one of the things, uh, you know, it was, uh, these things come along, and it's usually the younger generation uh, rebelling against the older generation. The children are rebelling against their parents. It seems that there's a certain 
one of the one I think one of the reasons that happens in American society and and America is contributing to that today more than ever is historically say in biblical times when a when a man a young uh, when a a boy became twelve bar mitzvah time he became a man puberty was entering into adulthood. Not anymore. You're in a child to at least 30 now. I mean, they, they talk about people in universities as if they're children. Well, you should, used to be you were expected to be married and have a job by the time you were 18. It's, it's uh, the... the uh, See, one, uh, and, uh, the time puberty that time, once people become, are in the, biologically are becoming adults and capable of reproduction, you know, that's, that's maturity in some ways. Uh, the, and, and they continue to be treated as children, that tends to produce a certain level of rebellion. Uh, and, and when society teach, uh, treats adolescents, which is a bogus name too, young adults as children, well, I guess they're free to act like children too, but that, that brings a sense of rebellion. It's, it is, uh, it's, it's evil, it's evil. But everything in the society is pretty much evil, uh, including the form of government. You know, when you think, it's, it's dangerous to think when you real when you think biblically and you realize because of the sinfulness of humanity, the universal sinfulness, that the, the uh, form of government based on majority opinion is inherently a bad idea, because the majority will usually uh, indicate what well, choose what's wrong. It, the uh, the um, he, unregenerate people, sinners, we are by nature entirely self-centered and we learn to express self-centered in self-centeredness in other in ways that uh, um, don't appear self-centered you know with involvement with other relationships and others and that we learn that that we can't uh, that we have to express that self-centeredness in a sophisticated way rather than a crude way <laughs> just taking things you know, like a two-year-old, that, that's mine. <laughs> Just take, you know, it's, it's totally self-centeredness. And then you're supposed to uh, understand, look, be taught that if you really want to get what you want, you're better off not acting that way. <laughs> but it's still self-centeredness. People, altruism in the world, charity in the world is actually self-centered because it's done for self-centered reasons. I including reasons like it makes me feel good. In other words, feel good about myself. Is what they mean when they say it makes me feel good. Feel is like I'm a good person and I can prove it because I, I give to charity and I volunteer for this and that. And I want to believe I'm a good person, in spite of my sinfulness. See, that, but God's standard is God. You're supposed to be the image of God. And when the Apostle Paul in chapter 3 of Romans says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, well, God's purpose in creation was man to be his image. And you cannot be a sinner and be the image of God. This whole idea that is so commonly taught today uh, and uh, among Christians and promulgated everywhere. No, but there's hardly a voice raised in opposition to it that, that human beings bear, continue to bear the image of God, fallen human beings. No, they don't. They, they, they bear the responsibility to be the image of God, but they don't do it. That's why it's sin. See, to Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, right? And he said, of course, I hope you know this, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your might. And, you know, I, I get a little kick of it, uh, kick out of these people. Or it's not so common anymore, but uh, it's like Wesley. Some of the followers of Wesley, especially, came up with this idea of sinless perfectionism. Yeah. Here, here's a commandment. Here's the greatest commandment. Go do it. All the time. Dwell that way. See, that's why we have to be not only born again, but we have to be transformed. Our bodies continually, our bodies, sin dwells in our mortal bodies, according to Scripture. Now, biologists might not be able to comment on that, or just say it's nonsense, but they don't know what they're talking about. God has said that. There are things that we cannot learn by observation. We have to, uh, and especially because of the blindness that sin brings humanity. It has to be revealed to us by God. It's just like so, there's no way science can search out origins. I don't care how big a space telescope they put up there. They, they cannot look at what happened when God created because they weren't there. Only God was there. It's not possible. The arrogance of man. See, their very acts are sinful. It's like uh, uh, sending men to the moon. That was an act of American arrogance and competition with the Russians. It was a space race. See, the Russians had put the first person in orbit, and so then Kennedy came out and he said, well, we're going to put a man on the moon before the end of the, uh, the decade. Spent how much money doing that, and at least three people got killed, and And along came the shuttle. I remember seeing that go off live. The first shuttle. No, I think I saw the second shuttle, too. And I remember where I was and what the reaction. I was in a passing, walking through a, a student commons area at the extension campus of the University of Wisconsin. and They had a big screen TV there. They actually had those back then. <laughs> and there were the, a lot of students were sitting there watching the uh, the launch of the the shuttle. I think was that the fir first one with a, a female astronaut? I don't think it was, but anyway, and it was going up um, and then suddenly there was a ball of fire and everybody's sort of like What's going on? Nobody really knew. And people were waiting to see the thing come out of the fire. That, and I said, it blew up. What happened? I said, it blew up. I was right. I was right. Uh, of course, most of them were just about 10 years younger than me, come to think of it. There's... <sighs> People don't grow up very fast nowadays. You're not expected to. Expectations, low expectations in education is a real problem. You sort of get out of people, to a degree, what you expect from them. You don't expect anything, you don't get anything. So I want to look at the scripture here and comment on something. And it has to do with largely with Christians. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15. I'll read the New King James. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. 
in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. There's a counterpart in the book of James in the New Testament. It talks about the, uh, that if a man comes into your assembly and he's wearing a, go uh, a poor man comes into your assembly and you, you find a place for him sitting on the floor. And then if a rich man comes with a nice gold ring on, you find the best place for him. You have judged with evil motives. See, the, the, the uh, ability of the rich to donate to the church, the problem of favoritism toward the rich in the church, out of evil motives, money. Yeah, the rich can give money, the poor can't, is not new. It goes back to the beginning. And the book of James is a very early book, it be, perhaps one of the earliest books in the New Testament. Definitely predates, I think it definitely predates the Jerusalem Council, so, which was a very early event. Uh, so, but see, the idea of justice is, is can be perverted. And he, in this case, it's poor versus uh, mighty. Uh, no, it's it's it, 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 God in the New Testament says it's God is no respecter of persons. That's what this refers to. That He does not discriminate based on your status as far as your wealth or your or your uh, power or your lack of such things God judges people as individuals based on equal equality equally human now now, in theory, that's one of the proper things in Western civilization, or used to be. It's disappearing rapidly. The idea of equality under the law. Now they want to throw that out. And it's they're really getting uh, reaping what they've sowed. The idea of favoring certain skin colors, regardless of the status of the individual. See, this is has nothing to do with the circumstances of the individual, but rather simply because you're a certain of a certain ethnicity or a certain color or a certain this or a certain that, you get preferential or non-preferential treatment. The idea, of course, the, the idiots on the Supreme Court, and that's all you can call them, the injustices, the idea that you can rem uh, remedy group discrimination by group uh, by prejudice in favor of a group. It's insanity. God judges individuals. There is groups are not real. They are not persons, just like corporations are not persons, in spite of the idiocracy of this country in the West. You know, there were no corporations in America in any kind of modern sense prior to, like, the Civil War. There were inventions of men. I think they had certain things somewhat like that that existed to do a certain purpose, and once that purpose was completed, they, you know, like, maybe build a road or something like that, and then they dissolved. But there was nothing like the modern corporate idea where the, now the Supreme Court has ga given non-human entities, legal entities, rights. Well, I say there are no rights, they're just responsibilities to God, which would be good. So all these corporations are responsible to God to do His will. That would solve a lot of problems. See, that's one of the problems, as I mentioned yesterday, in American society, and not just America. A democracy has, has no, is, is not moral. 
because the desire of the multitude is probably immoral. There is no one to give a direction to it, just like capitalism, uh, which is about the accumulation of capital, really. But let's say free enterprise, which is more uh, free markets. The problem is that you're dealing with allocations of resources, and it's being allocated to those with the most money. There, uh, there is, socialism really has a, has roots in Christianity, but they're liberal Christian roots. They're not godly, but God is very careful in the scriptures in the Old Testament and the law to limit the accumulation of capital. That you could not, the, the land belongs to him. It was allocated by God based on families and passed down, and it could not be permanently sold. So you couldn't have the rich gobbling up things forever. Uh, essentially, you could lease your land out until the next... Uh, uh, Sabbath of seven years and but then it went back you know in case you needed the money to survive and you just had a tough time or something so you could do that you could basically lease the land it would, what, but it wasn't a permanent sale uh, so God was careful to, to prevent the, see he knew that over time just like wealth, you know, compound interest, over time the rich would accumulate everything and then everybody else would be their slaves. Like Egypt. Sort of wonder about Joseph, you know. <laughs> oh well. I guess that's what happens to people that worship idols. That's probably why God had them sell themselves into slavery. Uh, because they were already slaves, slaves of sin. But, uh, yeah, no injustice. So you see, racial preferences, just like racial discrimination, is wrong with God. Everyone is judged individually. And you're not to show preference based on their lack of wealth or the abundance of wealth. Right is right and wrong is wrong, regardless of these things. And our courts have become utterly corrupt. The law itself is corrupt. The very idea that majority opinion can create laws, that's corrupt. God has spoken. God told, has told us what's right and wrong. We have to look to God's commandments uh, as far as government as a guide as far as what is just and what is not just. A, mo a majority opinion only constitutes mob rule. And it's a small step to that for my, to my mo minority mob rule, the most violent rule. We've seen that. Antifa and Black Lives Matter and riots in the street get your way if with the Democrats at least. They don't care. The use of violence and force. See, political parties, especially at least at this point, the Democratic Party, has declined to the point that they're no different than the Nazis and the communists and some other some of the other radical parties in Weimar in the Weimar Republic. And we're probably going the same direction. Willing to use violence in the streets to get your way. See, the, the, uh, the people that aren't interested in violence will, will often give in to demands because they simply want peace. But that's not justice. And again, the, I remember a course I had in political science, and I had a discussion with a professor, and I said, you know, in the United States, it looks an awful lot like the Weimar Republic. This was back in the 80s. Going that direction. He said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's worse. It's worse. See, the United, the United States today is, is imploding. See, it's, it's been living off borrowed money, 
especially since 9-11. The, the, the interest rates have pretty much been kept near zero since then. What, what that does that mean? The, the government is basically giving away free money to the banks it, to, to pump things up. So the banks get money from the Federal Reserve at uh, borrow it at 0% or 0.1% or something like that. And then they loan it out at, I don't know, 6%, 8%, whatever. See, the Federal Reserve is a... Uh, is a is owned by the banks <laughs> and it exists for the bank's benefit it's a scam it's a scam the american dollar is a scam now it used to be a silver certificate now it's an iou <laughs> sorry somebody somebody they're giving you somebody else's debt it's just a promise to pay another peep dollar <laughs> You can go redeem it for another piece of paper until they go all digital. Then you can just get another digital copy of it. It's nothing. I, 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 I'm I sort of rejoicing that crypto is going <laughs> private, pr private fiat currencies. Of course, the government wants to take that down anyway. See, it's more competition to the dollar. They got a problem right now because uh, the, the dollar is losing its status as the world reserve currency. Rapidly. And at that point, they won't... When America no longer has a world reserve currency, in other words, uh, international translations or, uh, transfers and payments are done in dollars as the common medium of exchange. At that point, when people have other options, you know, rubles or, or uh, uh, the, U, the Chinese yuan or, or whatever, a basket, somebody could come up with a basket currency or based on real assets or backed by things like wheat and oil. <laughs> Thing, essentials, gold, who needs it? It only has limited... Uh, actual utility but uh th then the dollar people will use see there's a, a law in economics called uh, good money pushes bad out so if you've got bad money uh that's not reliable and you've got good money the good money will always be chosen in preference y you probably do this i mean so, so many people don't even carry bills anymore including myself uh, that would have been a scary thought 20 years ago too but that you you might remember doing this that if you got a tattered dollar bill and you've got a nice crisp dollar bill when you go to the store and pull that pull a dollar bill out of the pocket out of your wallet or purse to pay something do you get rid of the tattered bill or do you get rid of the good crisp bill most people will keep the good one and get rid of the tattered one right of course, the banks, those all get uh, redone anyway. But uh, the tattered ones or the ones that tape together, they get taken out of circulation by the banks and the Federal Reserve, or the, the Treasury, the Mint, replaces them with freshly printed ones. Remember during COVID, there was a period you couldn't even get co coins. I haven't figured that out. I never had an explanation for that. Something was amiss. But justice, impartial justice, is what God demands. And Christians have to obey God. We have to oppose everything other than that. It, uh, racial preferences or racial discrimination, uh, different treatment based on anything other than your the person themselves what they have done or not done their own guilt or innocence is forbidden and we have to stand for that now i want to go over to another problem 
Now, this is, again, thinking biblically as Christians, we have to live as Christians. We cannot conform to the world. If you do, you're not a Christian. If you want to be popular with the world, just stop calling yourself a Christian. What's popular today? Atheism? New Age? Well, I don't know. Whatever. I, I guess it's, it doesn't really matter anymore. Sort of like hairstyles. There's no common one anymore. Uh, do, do whatever you want. Don't call yourself a Christian. Because you're not. I mentioned the other day the problem with uh, a, a corrupt idea of salvation that is correlated largely with dispensationalism for I, I don't know what reason. Maybe it's just by chance. I can't think of anything in the dispensational system that necessarily would lead in that direction. Because anomianism, lawlessness, uh, the idea that uh, you could live uh, a sinful, wicked life and go to heaven is not a new idea. It's a, 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 a perennial heresy that keeps popping up over the, over the millennia. Uh, well, the, the, the instigators behind some of these things are unseen spiritual powers, of course. But we often don't think in those terms. We ought to, but don't get obsessed about it. I've seen people that's so afraid of demons and everything else. They're, every noise they hear in their apartment or something is demonic. And the devil wants you to believe that, too. The Bible doesn't spend that much time dealing with that, that creature and his and his followers. He's more of a nuisance. Uh, but he does, in the world, if you're not in Christ, then you're under his domain. And he controls the world through fear, particularly the fear of death. And that's the biggest industry in the country, the fear of death. Think about it. The trillions and trillions of dollars that are spent on so-called health care. And, to, 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 and most of that money that goes into treatment is spent in the last, say, six months of a person's life. Huge amounts of money. In order to lengthen your life a couple months. Isn't that like a lost cause? Uh, and also life insurance and uh, what else? Uh, all the, the nutritional supplement business and all kinds of, all the gymnasium stuff. I mean, none of this, all this stuff at best has a marginal effect. At worst, it's negative because I think a lot of the, uh, the, the, of course, the profit motive has corrupted it all, too. These aren't the old days where you had a country doctor with a black bag and he, he came by the house and then you, you paid him. No, it's become this huge industry. It's the biggest industry in the country. And, uh, well, Obamacare, you know, all, you, see, the, you have the, you not only have the industri military industrial congressional complex, you have uh, the, the, uh, the government and the healthcare industry and the drug manufacturers and all this stuff is in a thing, too. Uh, modern pharmaceuticals didn't exist before about 1960. Then they started tampering with your body with drugs. Before that, it was surgery. There, there was limits. Then they started messing with things. My personal experience, as I've seen other people, is that once they start down the drug path, they soon have a table covered with drugs. And how good is that for you? God... God did not in, uh, create the human body to be constantly drugged with toxic materials. 
there's limits to what your your liver can put up with. It's like alcohol. It can handle small amounts of alcohol, designed for that. But large amounts, no. Uh, drunkenness, a, uh, a drunkard, a uh, habitual drunkard, uh, no. Well, drunkard is a, an alcoholic, as they call it today. A, a, a habitual, uh, a person who engages in habitual drunkenness. A habitual excess. Of course, like cocaine, everything is excess with that, and pot and everything else. That's that's all unbiblical, contrary to the will of God. It debases you. See, drunkenness it, it degrades the image of God. It 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 turns a person who's supposed to be the image of God into a slobbering fool, vomiting on the floor. That's if you've ever been sober around a bunch of drunks, it's not a pretty picture. Some people have never been sober around a bunch of drunks. The drunks think it's just fine because their brain has been put into a poor state of function by the alcohol. Small amounts are beneficial. Large amounts are bad. It's a general depressant of your nervous system. Definitely don't want to operate vehicles with it. By the way, that's sinful. Uh, drinking a uh, drugging or drinking yourself, whether it's legal or not, uh, if it's something that affects your uh, reaction times and whatever, and then go and drive in a vehicle on a public road, is sinful. It's a violation of loving your neighbor. You're putting your neighbor at risk. <sighs> but I was... Uh, Dealing with thinking biblically and Christianity and dispensationalism, and I was talking about the the corrupted uh, uh, idea of salvation that is simply a uh, um, what was the term an intellectual acceptance of a certain truth. Uh, the uh, the free grace theology where if you believe you're saved, you're saved. See, they think the evidence of salvation is you believing that you're saved. Not that there's any change in your life. They reject that. They absolutely reject the idea that God's salvation does anything in you. It's, it's a bare belief that you've been saved See, that's, it, it, it probably goes back somewhat to revivalism because revivalism often degenerates or usually degenerates into emotionalism. I had an emotion. I felt something happen. So therefore, I must be saved. Well, it's possibly, but the proof of that is the changes that God says will take place in you when he gives you a new spirit, a new heart, a, a change in attitude toward God, and a change in attitude toward sin, and a, uh, a ongoing change in behavior, that you, and you're not seeking, you, you and this is a, not an instantaneous trans change, but uh, there is a, a uh, setting apart of yourself to God that God does. See, it's a work of God. And God's work has evidence. And so uh, the, these people that are so hostile toward that uh, simply do not, I, I have to wonder where they're actually been saved. Or they're simply so carried al around along by their own theology that uh, they just repeat it. But what I want to talk about a little bit today is Something that's also connected with that, dispensationalism, and their idea of Israel. See, dis, one of the weird things about dispensationalism, unbiblical, utterly unbiblical, is they believe that God has two separate peoples, and he has a heavenly people, the church, and he has an earthly people, Israel, and they're always separate, and they have, they, they're 
have separate destinies generally in traditional dispensationalism. There's been some attempts to fix some of this stuff and make it more biblical, but uh, John Hagee, pastor, now 82 years old, I believe, of Cornerstone Christian Church in San Antonio. Uh, by the way, he's an adulterer. Uh, the, his current wife is a young woman that he committed adultery with in, I think, his original church in San Antonio. But if you look on the Hagee website, for some reason, he doesn't mention that. Uh, never. <laughs> but he has spent more time in the last decades, I don't know, 20, 30 uh, years, pimping for Israel. See, he has made statements that Israel, Jews, don't need to be saved through Jesus Christ. They can be saved through the Old Covenant, through the law. Really? I guess Hagee's never read the New Testament. He's never read Paul. But he, is, uh, he has been such a pimp for Israel that Israel, at one point, bought him a new jet so he can fly back and forth more often. He's been taking tours over there always. Israel can do no wrong. But that's the reason I, I read Leviticus 19, 5, 15 here, the, the, the law of Moses. Uh, now, in relation to that, I want to point out that Judaism today and since 70 A.D., is not Old Testament Judaism at all. It is rabbinical Judaism. It is the Talmud. The Talmud, the, the writings of the rabbis over the centuries, and the uh, traditions are the authority. A, a bit like Roman Catholicism, where the authority is tradition, not the Bible. So, you know, the, the, the Jews do not take the Old Testament literally at all. They can't. See, the, the, with the, God destroyed the temple for a reason, because Christ had come. The new covenant had come. He gave them 40 years of grace, and they, did, they ignored it. And so God says, well, I'm going to make it impossible for you to try to achieve salvation through the law, which you can't do anyway. I'll take the temple away. So you can't fulfill the law. And uh, so th the rabbis reinterpreted, they came up with a new system of salvation and a new system for the people to follow because they couldn't keep the law of Moses. It was impossible. It was physically impossible. Well, the dispensationalists believe, of course, they're going to rebuild the, the temple in Jerusalem and they're going to reinstitute uh, animal sacrifices and everything else, which would be an abomination. Abomination. Of course, Judaism is a denial of, of Jesus Christ. Anyway, they do not regard him. Well, the uh, he's regarded in the Talmud very, very poorly. Like an enemy, just the, the, just the most disgusting enemy of all. And of course, their language has been somewhat softened and changed in order to protect themselves. So it's, it's, it's written under pseudonyms and stuff. But when they talk about Jesus Christ, he's like the dirtiest of the, the lowest of the low, and currently undergoing extreme punishment in hell. But that's see, that's Orthodox Judaism. Um, I don't know what Reformed Judaism says, but they're certainly not in favor of him. See, you you can be an atheist and be regarded as a Jew. You can be an atheist in Israel and be accepted, no problem at all. Uh, they, they don't care if you're a Buddhist. But if you're a Christian and Jewish, the Supreme Court, I believe, has ruled that you, can't, you are no longer a Jew. You don't have the rights. See, uh, Jews have 
automatic uh, citizenship in Israel, and they're all all of them have the right to immigrate to Israel. Uh, but if you're a a, a Jew by birth, uh, your mother was Jewish, and you're a Christian, not so much. They have a definite hostility, and you can't blame it simply on how they were treated in certain countries. Uh, it goes back to the Talmud. The attitude toward non-Jews in the Talmud is basically they're a lesser form of life, and we'd be well if they all got killed. And if they are dying, don't help them to live. That's really, it's a sin in the Talmud, as I mentioned the other day, to if you find a Gentile in a pit that he can't get out of, uh, it's a sin for a Jew to help him get out unless it would become publicly known and therefore a scandal. Then, then it's impermissible to help him out for the reputation of the Jewish community. Uh, see, some of these things, when we wonder why there were pogroms against the Jews. Well, first of all, God's word said these things would happen to them. If you go back to the curses of the law, you will find that everything that happened to the Jews through history is in the curses of the law, including what happened to them under the Holocaust. But God has an ultimate plan. God has not forgotten them. But m almost, there's very few Jews who have come to faith in Christ. Initially, all the Christians were Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish. The New Testament, you know, some people say Luke was a, a, a non-Jew, but there really is no evidence for that other than he had a, 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 a Roman name. Well, that's nothing. I think Mark was a Roman name too. Paul, Saul, you know, uh, Paul changed his name from Saul to Paul. Paul is a Roman name. So you, you can't go on simply a person's name. It's like Timothy. His mother was Jewish, and his father was a uh, a Roman. Apparently, uh, but yet, under Jewish law, he'd be a Jew. But Paul circumcised him in order that he could enter the, the, the temple the, the, as, since it still existed there in Jerusalem. Anyway, that's a little different issue. But there, there is a hostility in, in uh, the Orthodox Judaism, the, the rabbinical Judaism, the, the Judaism that, that, that has the Talmud. Uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud, the Mishnahs are like the early beginning of the Talmud, uh, which was created, it, it's a continuation of the Pharisees. Uh, the, the religion of the Pharisees was highly tradition too. They had the law and then they had the tradition that they, was cl they claimed also was revealed to Moses. It just wasn't written down. Well, that's a scam. The whole idea that there's a secret teaching that's passed down that's not written, in other words, not public, what a scam that is. God doesn't do things like that. That's a, that's a refuge for liars. You can always claim whatever you want in something like that. Roman Catholicism does the same thing. In spite of the evidence, in spite of the proof of history, they'll claim the church always taught this. It just was tradition. It was unwritten tradition. The papacy always existed. Peter was the first pope, in spite of Peter not saying anything like that in the scriptures. in spite of the fact that in the scriptures at one point Peter was publicly rebuked by Paul 
for hypocrisy. For being timid. <sighs> but see, sinful men create things for their own advantage, their own profit, like the papacy. They, they, they want power. You, you think this is the uh, uh, people that are not regenerate, can, especially after Constantine, they flocked into the church for the advantages it gave them in a religion that was favored by the emperor and then commanded by the emperor uh, a generation or so later. Where you had to be a Christian. Which means you had to get, well, Constantine himself wasn't baptized until he was on his deathbed, so... But <clears throat> judging, it's like with Israel today, the state, the modern state of Israel, which I visited, and I was got an eyeful of some things. Apparently, God wanted me to see certain things that they didn't want to see. But uh, now I haven't lived around Jewish people too much. I remember when I was a little boy, I had a, a friend that was Jewish. And I could, I could remember, uh, I guess I was discriminating. His father said he, he didn't want his son hanging around with me <laughs> because of that. But, you know, I had forgotten about that for years. But uh, I don't hold anything against, uh, I, I probably wouldn't want somebody's kid hanging around with me either. But there, there's an attitude, and it's in the Talmud, and it's historically a Jewish attitude that I, I don't think the Jews themselves would deny this, that they they regard themselves as a, a people to themselves and a superior people. They're God's chosen people, uh, even though that's not true anymore uh, because they're not, uh, they don't keep, well, they don't keep the covenant anyway. See, none of them keep the Old Testament covenant. You can't. You have to go up to the old to the temple three times a year, and the temple doesn't exist. So uh, they, they observe the uh, the system of religion that the rabbis created for a people in exile again. See, after the seventy A.D. and then in the next rebellion in what one thirty four or something like that. Uh, Eventually, the Romans just had it with them and ran them all out of the country. The ones they didn't crucify. Rome was wicked. Evil. Selfish. Sinful. All goes together. You give sinful people lots of power, you'll see how sinful human beings are. Think House of Cards. Although I think the current administration is worse. But Christians have to look. We have to be willing. Like John, the reason I mentioned John Hagee and dispensationalism is because John Hagee has been uh, probably the strongest supporter of Israel in the United States, uh, especially among Christians, just constantly pimping for Israel. That's the only word that's proper that I can think of. Uh, not, uh, which is his. That's so radically affected him that he he has taught that Israel Jews can be saved apart from Christ, which is an absolute lie. See, he, John Hay, who is, happens to be a a Pentecostalish person, I'm not quite sure what category he'd fall into. Uh, which means that he doesn't regard scripture necessarily as the final authority. Obviously a lot of the, see t to be a to build a mega church like Hagee you got to have a scam. You can't preach the scripture truly. Even MacArthur has a scam. He doesn't truly preach the scripture with the purpose of the scripture. He just 
sort of if most of his sermons are filled with John MacArthur. But yeah, he goes through the scripture, spends maybe a month on a verse, which is an abuse of scripture. But he doesn't really present what God's saying. He's really presenting himself all the time, which is why I suspect he's not born again. There's, you, see, you can you can use the scripture. There, there's people often done that for their own purposes, for their own glory. I want to be a famous preacher. Well, that's not a reason to preach gospel. If you're doing it because you want to rather than you have to, perhaps you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but uh, the, the distortion of theology among Christians and the laziness of Christians and the uh, desire to be accepted among Christians within your own group causes a lot of problems. The unwillingness to think biblically, the unwillingness to stand alone with God, the unwillingness to judge righteously. Jesus said, judge with righteous judgment. Judge according to the God's word, according to what God says to you. He didn't say, you have to read judge not in the context. People want to just take one verse out and say, say this. Yeah, let's read the context together. And th then they'll immediately turn away. Let's go back and read the context. They don't want the context. They don't care what God says. But Israel, and I mentioned yesterday uh, when I saw back during one of their wars on Gaza that they were using white phosphorus against a civilian population. And I, I'll, have to, I'll have to say this. The, the Israelis do try to minimize casualties. They're not trying to kill the maximum number of people. Insofar as they will call up a building and say, we're going to bomb you, get out. And they, they've been lately pretty specific about taking down buildings, and they'll do what they say, knock on the building to make sure everybody knows it's about to happen. They drop a small bomb on the roof to knock on it. <laughs> and then give people, you know, like 60 seconds or whatever it is, a few minutes to get out. And then they destroy it. But the problem is, but this, uh, Gaza, w when they were using tank fire and uh, dry, white phosphorus, aerial bursts of white phosphorus, that is an absolute war crime. Uh, but the, the disproportionate punishment that they engage in, is also a war crime. And a community punishment is a war crime. When you punish an entire community for the acts of, of, of a, a one or a couple of people, that is a criminal a war crime. It's forbidden by international law. And yet United States gives cover to Israel, prevents sanctions being put on Israel, and uh, uh, American evangelicals and fundamentalists that are grossly too infatuated with Israel because of dispensationalism. And they're believing that, that Israel, secular Israel, is a sign of the coming of Christ, the near coming, which is, I'm not going to totally reject that idea, but Israel is not righteous. And to take Old Testament, the, the, one of the things that Hagee and a lot of these uh, Israel pimps do is they, they misquote Scripture. Now, they talk about God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. If you search out the actual scripture, God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse 
you. The promise to Abraham, who was righteous with God through faith. And they simply replace Abraham, the, the, they change this text. And because it's close, they get away with it. And because Christians do not examine things carefully, they don't think carefully biblically, and they want to be accepted in their group. They can't see the fact that they're being lied to and manipulated. Now, there's others that are just anti-Israel. I think uh, there, there are some, you know, the, the way the Israelis have, some of the things they do to the, to the Palestinians are just ungodly and wicked. Well, they're not Christians. They need to be born again. And they do resort to disproportionate punishment. This is the great thing that they they constantly practice you throw a couple of homemade rockets at us they land in a field and we're going to blow up a bunch of uh, large apartment buildings in uh, Gaza I know there's all kinds of things going on there with Hamas that's besides the point justice requires that you engage justly disproportionate punishment you do not cut off a man's hand because he stole the donut you require him to pay you two donuts back that's justice according to God because a few people in Gaza launch pipes filled with with crude explosives in the direction of Israel and that's about as close as they get usually occasionally they'll hit a house and occasionally somebody once in a great while might get killed you do not engage in punishing an entire group and then Gaza is a it is itself a prison camp. When Israel removed their occupation, they built a fence around it and closed Gaza to all outside traffic other than what Israel allows in. At least, uh, unless they've changed that status. I mean, they, they, uh, that is ungodly. And one of the reasons that we have this continual, there's two reasons that we have this ongoing struggle there. Both sides do this uh, vengeance practice. You hit me, I will hit you. You kill one of us, we'll kill two of you. And Israel especially practices disproportionate punishment, revenge against entire populations. And there's the historical lies on both sides are so deep. And they perpet both sides perpetuate myths about their own goodness and the wickedness of the other side. And beyond that, you have pretty much an insurmountable problem in their in the scriptures they use which isn't the bible the talmud has a distinctly hostile and negative attitude to all non-jews distinctly like your it's it's true there there is a the, the idea that, that, that Israel is a racist state and Judaism is a re racist religion is not untrue. Although Judaism as a religion isn't exclusively racial. Dominantly racial, but not exclusively. 
the idea that you know you're you're a Jew because your mother was Jewish, which is to me backwards. It should be your father, not your mother. But it's rabbinical, rabbinical Judaism, and th th there is blowback from this. Just like there was blowback, and one of the reasons that the Jews experienced pogroms in Europe in places like Germany and other countries in Christendom was their own attitude which was created by the Talmud uh, and the fact that they could only because Christendom at least in the West uh, usury interest was outlawed so the Jews uh, for Christians so a, a, there are no Christian bankers loaning money at interest was forbidden so but the Jews could do that so they became the bankers which made they make, and they became the wealthy ones the Jewish banking families like the Rothschilds and the uh, so the kings would go and borrow money from the Jewish bankers and then they'd have to pay large amounts of interest and they'd have to tax the people to pay the interest on the loans. This is historical. So, you, you know, there, there's always blowback. Uh, so, it's like, there's reasons for, and then you've got uh, ignorant, rabid priests just stirring things up. Christ killers. Uh, they're the ones who murdered Christ. No, your sin caused the death of Christ. Wicked, Ignorant priests stirring up trouble. And they they do they, they do that around the world today too, against non-Catholics. In Mexico, southern Mexico, when I was uh, one of the instructors at the language school I was attending, I was a missionary in uh, the southern area of Mexico. He had to flee. Uh, the church down there told, basically insisted he leave because they were concerned about his life and the life of his uh, family because the local priests would stir up the communities to sometimes kill the Bible believers in the area. Uh, they, weren't, uh, they wouldn't participate in their idolatry, so they would demand people contribute to the funds for an idolatrous procession or something, and then the, the Christians that wouldn't do that were persecuted. These were on, um, like, community farms, too. Collectives. I can't remember what they call them down there. Uh, but they were... Uh, so you were... The, gr the group, the, the farming community collective that you were part of, You were they would get together. Oh, we think it's a good idea to deal with this. And the, the Christians, the, the real Christians, say, ah, we don't want to participate in that. So they were outcast. And they were considered evil, and the local priests would sometimes uh, just rile things up and call them enemies of Christ, demons, everything else, and they'd end up dead. In Mexico. Recently. I think the state down there was Chiapas, that area. Uh, but... The, the Jewish hostility, the rabbinical or um, Talmudic hostility, let's put it on a document rather than uh, individuals, toward non-Jews. It's a historic reality and continuing. And it's obvious. It's obvious the way they treat Palestinians. They don't treat Palestinians as equals. But the Palestinians, the Muslim Palestinians, the, they have a document, too, called the Quran. And the Quran has a decidedly negative uh, view of Jews. Even uh, Christians... Now, Christians and Jews are better than, say, idolaters, say, like... Uh, uh, what the Muslims did when they went into India with the Hinduism and the idols, it was just 
they were just utterly barbaric. I mean, they, they Islam conquered mostly by the sword. Well, state Christianity, you know, under Charlemagne and others too. The king became a Christian, so all your all the subjects became Christians, whether you like it or not. That's not real Christianity. It's a superficial religion that's somehow related to Christianity, but it's not the real thing. Neither is the empty uh, free grace uh, salvation where God doesn't do it. It's just based on something you do a prayer you said, or this or that, and there, and because you believe you're saved, you're saved. That's a lie. Faith is not intellectual assent. It's a living relationship with Christ and commitment to him, trust in him. If you believe someone, if you love someone, you trust them. you don't, you haven't been born again. And a dis 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 distortion of what born again means. But the, the Muslims, because of, the, I think the in the Quran, in one point, this is, the, the Quran is, is a little weird. It, it varies. The early writings were much more peaceful, and then once Muhammad got power, and he, had a, he was sort of ruthless with anyone that crit criticized him for more than a little. He didn't really lead the Great Crusades, but uh, there was a Jewish tribe, and he just wiped them out. They wouldn't accept him, so they wiped him out. He wiped them out. And his attitude toward uh, Jews got decidedly negative, and he, I think at one point, refers to them as pigs and monkeys. Um, but that's not, I mean, it's not a really big theme in the Quran, but still. The Quran is decidedly different than the New Testament. I don't the the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Even though uh, Islam recognizes that Moses was a prophet of God, it doesn't have the Ten Commandments in there. Uh, Mo, uh, uh, Muhammad's knowledge of Judaism and Christianity apparently was very sparse and very corrupted is like mostly traditions and uh, by word of mouth through travelers or something oh i saw this in damascus and this is what they believe there and that kind of stuff which can get you some really distorted views and uh the the uh the passages in the quran that that somewhat correlate with biblical passages but they're occasionally but they're usually quite distorted uh, but but the the, uh, the the point being the the host the the hostility in Islam now there's greater hostility toward uh, like Hindus uh, with the uh, with the uh, multiple gods and idols things like that they really hate of course when uh, Muslims see Christianity like what they see in Jerusalem or the Middle East is Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, which has an abundance of idols. Idol worship, uh, which is how it certainly appears to them, you know, the worship of images is like the ultimate sin. The, the, uh, Islam generally, Muslims generally have no knowledge of biblical Christianity. And of course, that kind of worship is to Jews an abomination too. So what the, the, what when Jews see Christians, what they generally see is Orthodox and especially Roman Catholic, Catholics, which isn't real Christianity, not biblical Christianity. But there's this there's this, this this attitude in both the Quran and in the Talmud 
that set the Jews and the Palestinians, or the Jews and everybody else, and the Muslims and everybody else, against one another. How can you resolve that situation in Israel, in the land of Israel? Uh, because both sides, serious Muslims, are not going to disown the Quran, and serious Jews aren't going to disown the Talmud. How can you fix it? Well, there's only one who can fix it, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the underlying issue, and Christians have to look at both sides and deal justly, to appraise them honestly and biblically, and not give fawning support to the state of Israel or to the Palestinians, depending on what branch of Christian you are, too. The Palestinians are guilty. They're sinners. The Jews are sinners. That's what the Bible says. And not treat people as groups. Their identity is them, them, they themselves. Singular. And they will, one at a time, they will be judged individually by God. Not because of what group they were. Not because of what land they were from. Not because of who their parents were. Or their ancestors. And both groups, of course, claim to descent, descent from Abraham. It's interesting that, that uh, Trump, or Trump's uh, son-in-law, used that angle on the, uh, to bring the peace agreements that he did, and that was uh, the Abraham Accords based on the, the idea that they were all descendants of Abraham, so they ought to be able to get along to at least a certain degree. Uh, but, uh, and I think everybody was just tired of some of the fighting. But it, uh, do not, you know, Israel just bombed the Damascus International Airport again the other day. Israel is able to use their military with impunity in part because of the United States. And the reason the, the Jews are so influential in the United States, well, half the Jewish population of the world lives in the United States. The other half lives in Israel, and just the other just scattered here and there. It, it's not quite clear whether more Jews live in the United States or more Jews live in Israel. But even in the United States, they're a very small population. I think there are probably more Muslims living in the United States than Jews. So why are the Jews so influential? Well, it has to do with money. <laughs> money is power. Uh, they have power out of proportion to their numbers. Just like, uh, you know, but it's, it's just like uh, there are, pro you know, the, the Protestants in this country have nobody on the Supreme Court. There's a couple of Catholic uh, judges and there's Jewish judges. That's it. They have influence out of, for whatever reason, out of uh, proportion to their numbers, but that's, you know, that's no, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be anti Jewish, that sinful men are, sinful people are sinful pe people. But just trying to explain why things are the way they are. Uh, they they tend to be fairly united and have a they're a, a voting block, a powerful voting block, powerful lobbyist group. It's called J Street. And uh, not all Jews in America support Israel. But again, you've got people that have an auto, that have dual citizenship, and you know Jesus said no one can serve two masters. I would rather serve no master than those, than either one of those. My master is Christ. My loyalty is not to Israel, and it's not to the United States. It's to Christ. And I'm not Jewish. But uh, and I'm, not, I'm not loyal to the white race or any nonsense like that either. See, that I, I judge the existence of these things and the rightness of these things by the word of God, and you must do that too. You shall do no injustice in judgment. 
You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. You treat them as individuals and judge based on what's right and wrong by the word of God. This country has abandoned that, and in so doing, it has abandoned justice itself. And the court system and the legal system has become a lie. Democracy, the idea that, well, it's a lie. As, as interesting, Putin made a, a statement that is so true, Mr. Putin, over President Putin, said that the West, I think, how does he, he says, it's nothing but, a, but lies. It's true. It's true. The Enlightenment was a bunch of lies. And you build a society... It's humanism, the exaltation of man. And you build a society on that rather than on, on the revelation of God. And you cannot have justice. You cannot even know what is just. Because sinful humanity can't discern that because sin has blinded their eyes and darken their hearts. And that's why you need to be born again. That's why everyone needs to be born again. They need a new heart, a new spirit. And God must enlighten them. And my hope is a soon, hopefully very soon, return of Jesus Christ. As it says in the Bible, Maranatha, come quickly. Lord Jesus.